Welcome to I-24 News Defense Magazine. I'm Alon Ben David with your weekly review of security, intelligence, and strategic affairs. In this edition, we talk to Amos Yadlin, former head of the IDF intelligence and currently the Zionist Camp Party's candidate for the Minister of Defense about the challenges ahead for the new IDF Chief of Staff. We go to the annual INSS International Conference to ask if the world has accepted a nuclear Iran and if we will have time, we will reveal a new system for shooting training. Let's begin. Lieutenant General Gadi Eisenkot was sworn in on Monday as the 21st IDF Chief of Staff, replacing Lieutenant General Benny Gantz, who led the IDF for the last four years during some of Israel's most turbulent times. Maxim Peretz has more. The ceremony at the Kirya in Tel Aviv, headquarters of the Israeli military, marked the end of Lieutenant General Benny Gantz's term as Chief of Staff and formalized the transfer of power to his successor, Lieutenant General Gadi Eisenkot. Four years earlier, on February 14, 2011, at the same place, Benny Gantz is handed command of the IDF. He inherits an army restored to working order by Lieutenant General Gabi Ashkenazi, unaware that its military capabilities would be severely tested. Gantz's first year is remembered for the release of Gilad Shalit, Gilad. the 11th of October 2011. In Gaza, good news will not last. From January to October 2012, nearly 800 rockets and mortar shells are fired into Israel from Palestinian territory. On November 14th, Benny Gantz implements the start of Operation Pillar of Defense. The offensive starts off dramatically by assassinating Ahmad Jabari, the Hamas military leader. However, the Islamist movement has an answer. For the first time, Tel Aviv is targeted by rockets. Despite mobilizing thousands of reservists, Benny Gantz does not send the ground troops in. A few months later, Gantz observes a new front opening up on the northern border of Israel. With Syria embroiled in civil war, Israel warns Damascus against transferring sophisticated weapons to Hezbollah. On May the 6th, 2013, several explosions shake the Syrian capital. According to the rebels, Israeli warplanes bombed military warehouses. These raids are the first in a long list attributed to the IDF. 2014 is a difficult year for Gantz, marked first of all by the kidnap of the three Israeli teenagers in Hebron, and then by Operation Protective Edge once again facing Hamas. Fifty days of fighting inside and around the Gaza Strip, which will somewhat dent Gantz's image. Following a range of challenges throughout a tumultuous term as chief of staff, Gantz leaves the position with the respect of many of his peers, but with an army weakened by budget cuts and by still worrying threats on the country's borders. We are joined now by retired General Amos Yadlin, former head of Israel's military intelligence, currently on a leave from uh, heading the Institute for National Security Studies as he joined the Zionist Camp Party and is their candidate for Minister of Defense. Thank you for joining us, General Yadlin. Good evening, Alon. What, in your opinion, should be the first thing on the agenda of the new IDF Chief of Staff? Yeah, it is always for the Chief of Staff to take the immediate uh, steps needed to keep the security of, of Israel, but in the same time to look into the horizon to the longer range. So on the longer range, he has to uh, rebuild a multi-year plan uh, with the right budget, and this he should do with the next uh, government. He has to think about the Israeli operational concept, how to operate the IDF vis-a-vis states, uh, close and very far away, non-state organization in a many, many different scenarios. From the things you're saying, it seems that you believe the IDF needs a change. I think the IDF all the time needs to adapt and to learn. Uh, General Gantz have done a wonderful uh, job in uh, bringing back the IDF from the rough, the rough time of, you know, the head of the... Uh, uh, IDF and the defense minister not thinking alike. He brought back the need of the IDF to be uh, very much on the same course and have a dialogue and a good dialogue with the political level. Uh, he went through two uh, rounds of uh, uh, hostilities, I don't call it a war, in Gaza. But with all due respect to Hamas, he is not our main enemy. Our main enemy is Hezbollah. Our main enemy is Iran. And on this, the IDF should be uh, prepared according to the changing circumstances. 
Prime Minister Netanyahu said yesterday that the coming four years might be even harder than the previous four. What are the chances that Eisenkot would have to lead the IDF to another war? Uh, you know, Alon, the last real war we fought, uh, in my eyes, are 40 years ago, uh, the Yom Kippur War. All these uh, rounds, military hostilities that we have, I don't call it a war. And no doubt that if you call it a war, that during uh, the next four years, the chances for another round, whether in the north or in the south, are quite high. Because the deterrence of Israel was never so strong on one hand, but the willingness of our enemies to make mistakes and challenge us is also going up. And I can see uh, General Eisenkot leading Israel to another campaign in the north and another campaign in the south. And we have to be ready for it. You don't call it war, but looking at Hezbollah, it seems that the military challenge that it poses to Israel is a significant one. It is 10 times bigger than the challenge in the last summer. So when I said last summer that I was not satisfied with the strategic achievement of the campaign in Gaza, I called it uh, an asymmetrical tie, a strategic tie uh, results of the, of the campaign. No doubt that vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah, we will have to be uh, much more stronger, much more uh, imaginative, with taking the initiative and playing according to our uh, uh, rules of the game and not their rules of the game. With Hezbollah, we have an advantage that we haven't in 2006, that we are not differentiating anymore between the Lebanese state and Hezbollah. And we do have a better intelligence, we do have uh, a better uh, capability to attack Hezbollah, and I think uh, General Eisenkot is the guy to lead this campaign. He was five years in the northern border. He knows exactly uh, how to deal with Hezbollah. Finally, if indeed the world would make what Israel calls a bad deal with Iran, where does it leave Israel? Is the military option still relevant? I think the chances for a bad deal are quite low uh, because the P5 plus one has their uh, you never say red lines these days, but if Iran will not come to Tehran with their point that they will be rolled back at least a year and the inspection, verification uh, of Iranian activity will be very, very tough. Uh, I'm not sure the Iranians are there. But if a bad deal will be achieved, uh, then Israel is left alone with the only option that we always said is the last resort that if all the other options are not stopping Iran, then Israel may uh, uh, think about other options. Thank you, General Yadlin, for this sober, if not to say uh, somber assessment. Thank you. Staying in the INSS, which is holding its eighth annual international conference, Israel in turbulent region, two of the major topics on the agenda are the possible uh, nuclear deal with Iran and the rift between the United States and Israel. Before we go to the conference, Lauren Izo brings us the latest. We are staying with the uh, INSS, which is holding its eighth annual international conference, Israel in Turbulent Region. Two of the major topics of the uh, agenda are a possible nuclear deal with Iran and the rift between the United States and Israel. Before we go to the conference, Lauren Izo brings us on the latest. Reaching a deal over Iran's nuclear program appears to be a high priority for the Obama administration, but it is unclear whether Iran will agree to scrap its plans completely or whether world leaders will be able to accept a nuclear Iran. The Islamic Republic insists its uranium enrichment is for peaceful purposes only, but some, notably Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, believe Tehran could be on its way to building an atomic bomb. U.S.-Israel relations appear to be continuing on a downhill slope due to tensions over the negotiations between Iran and world powers. Israeli media reported earlier this week that communication between Washington and Jerusalem over the Iran talks has been cut off because of Netanyahu's upcoming speech to Congress in March. The White House has denied these allegations. 
Netanyahu's speech in Washington on the Iranian issue has been called unethical by U.S. Democrats due to its time proximity to Israeli elections and the claim that the White House was not informed of it in advance. In October, the U.S. president sent a letter to Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, in which he proposed collaborating in the battle against the Islamic State if a deal was signed. Last week, the supreme leader reportedly responded to that letter respectfully but with no mention of any commitment. Other countries in the region have joined the fight against IS in recent weeks, most recently Egypt, which vowed to retaliate for the mass murder of Egyptian Coptic Christians in Libya. If Tehran does choose to join the U.S.-led anti-IS coalition, relations between Washington and Jerusalem will be further frayed by a U.S.-Iran alliance. We are now joined from the annual INSS International Conference in Tel Aviv by Ray Take, a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, specializing in Iran, and former senior advisor at the U.S. State Department. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. In the current conference, you've participated in a panel on the question whether the world has practically accepted a nuclear run. Well, has it? No, I don't think so. Uh, not at least in a formal way. Uh, but the fear is, in many quarters, I think, fair enough to say in Israel that the international community is about to accept Iran having capacity and certainly capability to be able to manufacture a bomb in the future. But in terms of actually accepting it at this stage, I don't think that's the case, no. Is it just the impression from this side of the ocean that the U.S. administration is even more eager than the Iranians to strike a deal? Well, I think that both sides are eager for an arrangement that kind of settles this issue, at least settles it for a time. So all the participants in the talks at this point want a deal, uh, and they're all working to get one. Now, whether they're going to get a deal that is permissible, that is restrictive, that's a different question. But I think both sides are quite eager now. Assuming that the emerging deal would eventually leave thousands of centrifuges spinning in Iran and that sanctions would be lifted, do you believe the world would have the attention to continue and monitor the Iranian program for years to ensure that Iran won't develop nuclear weapons? I, I think the compliance and enforcement of this deal over a prolonged period of time, 10 years or so on, is going to be very problematic. And at various stages, there's going to be violations or technical disagreements and how international community lead, deals with those technical disagreements will go a long way to ensure the viability of an agreement at all. Why is such a deal considered as the pinnacle of the Obama administration's foreign policy? Well, I think it's considered better than the alternatives. The alternatives being potentially Iranian program that operates without much restraints or potentially the employment of use of force against it. So it's not so much whether it's pinnacle or not, but I think they tend to view it as a better alternative than some of the other ones that have been under consideration. You've heard the Israeli concerns about the emerging deal. Could you soothe them? I can understand Israeli concerns. Uh, uh, there's always been a dissonance between the United States and Israel on this issue, simply because the United States is a large power and it's geographically distant. Israel is a smaller state in a more dangerous position. And that essentially defines the disagreement between the two states. The United States can live with a more permissible deal while it was more difficult for Israel to do so. So that fundamental gap between the two powers has yet to be bridged. And I'm not sure if it will be bridged in a final agreement. What are the chances that you give to the efforts to reach a deal in the coming months? I, I, I'm just not sure, frankly, about whether that could happen. But I suspect if it doesn't, these negotiations will go past July. Thank you very much for the interview, Mr. Taki. And we end on a different note. A new Israeli system attempts to advance accuracy and safety in shooting practice. I-24 News' Maxim Peretz went to check it out. At first glance, this image looks familiar. A shooting range. Men aiming at targets about 10 feet away. Classic Israeli police special forces training. But behind the targets at this shooting range is an innovation called Stargates, a new system that allows for safer training. The main problem during training is that the shooter is very nervous about how many targets he achieved, quickly checking the gun for forgetting to remove the charger. Most accidents happen in this period. With our system, there's no need to go into a shooting area to count hits. 
Davidson, Safe Star director, has been part of the Israeli security forces for many years. His unique expertise in the area of weapons has helped him to identify the need this system answers. Yeah. With small sensors attached to the box placed in front of the target and connected to Wi-Fi, information from the targets is transmitted directly to the tablets of the shooters. The software processes the data received immediately. This is a one-of-a-kind system in the works. It is based on a very old technology that we advanced and improved. The information can be used to evaluate trainers' performance. So I press the target number one. I feed all the data in and I have all the information, all the statistics, and I can also give the shooter a timer. From the minute he hears the buzzer, the shooter draws the weapon and shoots. This way I can tell how quickly he responded, if he hit the target and where. But the system is also about safety, especially for instructors. With this system, I do not need to run with the trainees to count the number of hits. In terms of security, this is a really big advantage. After shooting training, you want to know how the shooter did, how many targets he hit. With percentages, and the system provides these statistics. In Israel, Stargate system is already operational in the armed forces as well as the private security companies. But SafeStar's goal is to grow out of the local market to the American market and beyond. Next stage would be to be able to do it from home. That's all we have time for. From here, from uh, Jaffa Port, we wish you a peaceful and safe night. Thank you.